Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Michael Levien, Assistant Professor of Sociology at John Hopkins University in the United States. And we shall be talking about the Trump presidency in the United States and the growing resistance against it. Hello, Michael. Hi, thanks for having me. For many people, the election of Donald Trump as the US president came as a big shock. The Democratic Party leadership thought that Hillary Clinton will win anyway because she is not Donald Trump. And that turned out to be a losing strategy. How did this happen? I would say that I was not as surprised as some people. Things have changed in the US economically, and we're starting to see the political expression of that um, in the sense that we've seen uh, three decades of uh, neoliberal economic policies that have led to large scale job loss, um, deindustrialization, that's an older story, uh, global financial crisis, which led to the um, evisceration of a huge amount of wealth, uh, particularly in working class um, communities, and we're seeing levels of income inequality that, um, that are unprecedented, that we haven't seen since the 1920s. And if you go into a lot of like, rural areas of the US, um, you would have a sense of this, right? That there's actually a lot of um, anger, um, agriculture is decimated, there's not that many jobs. Even the service sector jobs, the low paying, non unionized jobs, that uh, replaced the unionized um, blue collar industrial jobs that are now gone. Even those are starting to disappear with you know, Amazon and kind of online retail replacing many of those jobs. All is not well <laughs> economically in much of the US right now. And I think that's what much of the Democratic Party does not understand. So I actually thought the key moment of this election, the critical juncture was the primary between Bernie Sanders and Clinton. I thought actually that this was going to determine the election. I thought if Sanders won uh, the primary, he would win the national. And I was extremely scared about Hillary Clinton winning the primary because I thought she'd be extremely vulnerable uh, to Donald Trump. Um, you can look at it this way. I mean, given this kind of economic situation, um, there's actually a pretty broad and unprecedented section of the population that's saying actually pretty radical economic things in some ways. They're saying we want to get out of free trade agreements. Um, it's saying that, um, you know, the income is distributed at the top, that the corporations control government. So you hear this actually across the spectrum. And in some ways that could be, that's a, that's a sentiment that could be channeled in different kinds of ways. Just like in the 1920s, right, where you saw the Great Depression get channeled into fascism in some places, to social democracy in some places, to communism in others. Um, I think we're in a kind of similar moment, like globally right now. And what was really remarkable and the positive story we should keep in mind was the unprecedented success of Bernie Sanders' campaign. I mean, I never thought I would actually see in my lifetime ever a candidate who is avowedly socialist. At least he's, I mean, he says he's probably a social democrat, really. Um, but the fact that he says he's actually a socialist, uh, you know, is, makes me give all the more credit to him. I mean, and that was phenomenal to see him get that much support and to come that close to winning the Democratic nomination was incredibly inspiring kind of thing. And that was the road not taken. We could be celebrating the first socialist president of the United States, and now we have this kind of quasi-authoritarian, fascist, whatever you want to call it, white supremacist kind of government um, that's, that's in power. Um, so I think that was the critical juncture. And I think what really we have to understand is the failure of the Democratic Party here. Um, unlike India, with a rich parliamentary system and you know so many parties, even if you have two major ones, in, in the U.S. is such a more is much more constrained, right? We have two parties. It's almost impossible for third parties to get, uh, you know, through that. Um, Ralph Nader used to talk about the duopoly, right, between the Democrats and the Republicans, both pro-business, both neoliberal, uh, and so on. Um, now Sanders showed that you could actually break out of that with someone the Democratic National Committee doesn't want, right, who's not taking huge. Uh, um, campaign contributions from corporations or PACs, and that with small individual donations and a grassroots campaign that you could actually come out of nowhere and have this huge um, success, win many primaries and come very close to winning the nomination. We know the Democratic National Committee did everything it could to sabotage this campaign. And one thing to keep in mind is that the Democratic Party has also changed in terms of socioeconomically. Um, I mean, it's abandoned its working class base um, for at least 30 years, and the composition of Democratic voters has shifted and has become more uh, professional uh, and middle class. 
um, and urban and elite. Uh, the United States has never been known for a strong social security system if you compare it to many European countries, for instance. Uh, but whatever welfare mechanisms existed, even they seem to be under attack once Trump came to power. Do you have to say something about that? I mean, of course, the big issue now is the health care bill. And of course, many of us are critical of Obamacare in the first place because we thought he should have pushed for a single payer system and maybe we would have at least wound up with a hybrid um, you know, system where there's a public option. We didn't even get that. And I faulted Obama for that. I don't think he pushed hard enough in his first two years where he had political capital and could have done a lot more uh, to advance economically progressive um, kind of legislation, which he didn't do. So we wound up with this faulty health care bill that is certainly better in the sense that, look, there was 40 million people that didn't have insurance before this, um, but it had big problems. Um, and that's partly because we didn't go for a single payer system or these kind of public options. So yeah, so of course Trump campaigned on this economically progressive message, but um, I think those who actually believe that <laughs> uh, message, you know, I think must be getting disappointed if they're actually looking at what he's doing in the sense that he is cutting this legislation, trying to. I mean, what's interesting, they're having a hard time actually taking this benefit away now. Um, his budget proposals are incredibly regressive and involve huge cuts to all kinds of social programs. And I haven't gone through uh, yet in the way he's proposing. If they did, they'd be absolutely um, catastrophic, really. Um, and so we've also seen him stack his cabinet with the heads of industry. The policies of the Trump administration has triggered a wave of uh, protests and growing resistance movements in the United States. Uh, what do you think about those? And what is the relationship between these resistance movements and the Democratic Party? Um, good question. And yeah, it started right away with the, um, with the Women's March, which happened the day after the inauguration. And that was quite an incredible protest, actually, although it was strongly a kind of democratic, um, maybe older school, second wave feminist uh, approach that was very strong. You also had many unions participating, you had radical uh, you know, and queer feminists involved. Um, you had people with Black Lives Matter um, involved. So it was actually a really kind of amazing and huge protest. So that kind of set the tone right away um, that this is gonna be, there's gonna be um, you know, a lot of resistance emerging. Then of course there was the reaction to the, um, the Muslim ban. Uh, and that was an encouraging set of protests that emerged in a totally unplanned and ad hoc way of people going to airports, right, and protesting. There's also now dozens of resistance groups of various kinds. It's a very big and complex terrain now um, that's across the political spectrum. I think the left in the U.S. has for a long time, you know, I think a lot of it has been kind of anarchist because there's been this view that both parties are corrupt. We just can't get any headway in this electoral system. You know, there was the effort of Ralph Nader. Um, in the 2000s, and we saw that the Green Party really never got very far. And I think that Occupy was a critical moment here. So I think in some ways the Sanders campaign represented this recognition on the left that actually, you know, we need to relate to the electoral process in some way. Otherwise, we're just going to get, you know, steamrolled by someone like Trump. Um, and the problem, of course, is that there's such enmity uh, on the left towards the Democratic Party, that it's, you know, it's, it's very difficult to say, all right, let's try to take over or change the Democratic Party, um, because it seems almost impossible. And even we've seen, you know, they haven't learned the lesson from the Sanders campaign. They um, rejected the, um, the more progressive candidate that um, tried to run for, that ran for the um, DNC chair. Uh, in favor of an old guard Clinton cabinet member. Um, they did, they were forced to make Sanders part of this kind of leadership um, committee, but it's not clear how much power they're giving him. It's not clear that the Democratic Party still wants to support progressive candidates um, that have a Sanders type program. In fact, it's clear that they don't want to support them. So it's still very difficult, but it, it's, you know, it's, it's a very difficult situation because there's no other party. And it's almost impossible for a third party to break through in the US system. There's huge entry costs. And so then the question, you know, people are debating, do we need another party? If it's gonna be another party, what kind of party should it be? 
Um, for example, Democratic Socialists of America um, is a party that has been around for a while, but has gotten a lot more traction uh, since the Sanders campaign and a lot of new members. And, you know, I think they have a pretty mature approach to this where they're saying, you know, we need to relate to this um, electoral process, but we can't be captured by the Democrats, that we need to maintain autonomous kind of social movement power. Um, we'll run our own candidates, but if the Democrats, you know, will have uh, put forward a progressive kind of Sanders type candidate, we're not going to run someone against them. Um, so I think that's now, I mean, going forward that we know that this kind of candidate has um, a chance of winning. And I think we'll have to think more deliberately about how to build up that kind of infrastructure and to kind of um, articulate a coalition, right, around um, uh, class inequality, around racial domination, and around, uh, you know, patriarchy and, and gender inequality. So I think that's, that's, a, that's a key. But I think that one of the things that he did not do well was to break out of a kind of old left discourse where it's the main contradiction is always class and everything else is kind of secondary so racial inequality will be solved by addressing class inequality and i think that's a really big lesson that the left should have learned by now and you know i, I he was perhaps unfairly targeted because his policies um, were far more progressive than clinton's uh, and track record on issues that would matter a lot to um, black Americans. There's not a very strong left tradition in the US. Uh, I mean, there was, but it was really obliterated in the early part of the 20th century, mid 20th century, Palmer raids, McCarthyism, and the Cold War, right? So talking about socialism <laughs> was really taboo, you know, and it's still remarkable that accomplishment of Sanders to reintroduce that and to, in a sense, you know, disarticulate socialism from authoritarianism and rearticulate it to democracy, right? Democratic socialism. And I think that was uh, a, a huge accomplishment. Trump had tried to give the impression during the election campaign that he wouldn't want to wage too many wars and so on. Uh, but he seems to have uh, flip-flopped on this promise. What do you have to say about that? You're absolutely right, and uh, it was not a promise that I ever took seriously. Uh, I think that the really dangerous thing now is as this Russia investigation moves forward and they're getting closer and closer to, to him and his inner circle, you know, will he resort to the kind of, you know, um, well-worn strategy of uh, authoritarian leaders of trying to actually generate conflict to distract attention uh, from this kind of growing scandal. And I think that's a very scary thing. I mean, I think this is someone who makes decisions in an incredibly irresponsible way. It could be based on his mood. I mean, it's, it's a very scary kind of um, prospect that this guy is ordering, you know, the biggest bomb uh, in the U.S. government's military's arsenal to be dropped um, while he's having, uh, you know, uh, dessert with the, you know, Chinese leader and Mar-a-Lago. I mean, that is something that's just deeply disturbing. I mean, this is someone you think might actually start a nuclear conflict through his tweets. So there are sections in the Democratic Party who wants to impeach Trump. Do you think that is a viable strategy? You know, I think it's just not up to the Democratic Party. Uh, they don't control uh, Congress. So the question is, how bad does it have to get before the Republicans also decide that it's in their interest to impeach him? And so far, it's not in their interest. So how this um, Russia investigation plays out will be, um, you know, crucial uh, to this. Now, I think that there's clearly, I mean, there's so much smoke. There's definitely some fire. We've already seen these revelations coming out one by one by one, getting closer to Trump. Now, look, do I think that this is the most important issue facing the U.S.? No. Uh, and I'm also worried about this kind of like anti-Russia holdover discourse from the Cold War. That said, obviously what he did was problematic and also it's kind of useful in a way that he's getting so bogged down in this that he's not been able to accomplish the legislative um, agenda that he wants to. Best case scenario for, um, for the left is that this drags on for another year or so right about up into the midterm elections, then gets so bad that Republicans lose both houses of Congress. So by the time Trump gets impeached uh, and Mike Pence comes into office, who's also a pretty dangerous 
uh, an extremely conservative uh, person, uh, he won't have two houses of Congress to advance his agenda. And then it's just going to be kind of waiting out to the next election. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks, Michael, for talking to us. And thank you for watching NewsClick.